Hello, my name is Amy Green, Marketing Director with Zimbit. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on Salesperson to Smarketer, How to Survive in the New Normal. Our presenter today will be Derek Wazinski, but before I pass it over to Derek, I'd like to go through just a few housekeeping items before we get started. First off, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the session. There is a questions pane located in the Go to Meeting side panel. You can take a moment to locate that. The questions pane you can type questions into and we can respond live uh, or we can address your questions at the end. We're also going to be recording today's session and everyone will get a link to that recording following the webinar today. So with that, I will pass it over to Derek. Thanks so much, Amy. Uh, can you hear me? Everything's uh, coming through clear? Okay. okay Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for joining today. My name is Derek Wazinski. I'm the uh, Chief Sales Hacker. Uh, I guess that's my title here over at uh, Zinbit. And today, we're going to have a, uh, the webinar is about uh, something I call Sales Purser to Smarketer, Surviving in the New Normal. Talking a little bit about what I believe smarketing is. Uh, and uh, smarketing is a, is a mixture of sales and marketing. It's definitely something that I think has uh, been coming for a long time. It's something that we practice here at Zinbit. And I think hopefully you'll find this informative. So. At the very first, uh, in a very first slide here, I want to talk about a sales mantra we talk a lot about in sales that we don't take no for an answer. This is from a scene from the movie Tommy Boy, which is a great, which is a great sales, uh, uh, a sales related movie. Uh, talking a little bit about not taking no for an answer, that we're going to push, that we're going to go ahead and talk to people, we're going to pick up the phone, we're going to call them, we're going to knock on doors, we're going to get in front of people with grit and hustle and determination and we're gonna make sales happen. And I think uh, I think this movie and other movies like this and other 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 thoughts about what sales is and what business to business sales really kind of go through the same uh, uh, same you know the, this this same kind of mantra, the same kind of kind of person. What we have to really think about is the year this movie was released, a little company named Amazon only made about fifteen million dollars in revenue. Um, last year alone, a company named Amazon made a revenue of $136 billion. Uh, it's becoming abundantly clear to me as someone who's been in sales for the past 20 years that we don't live in the world Tommy Boy lived in anymore. We don't live in a world where the practices and the traditions and the way we were able to go ahead and bring business and get people interested in our products and services, they can't exist in that world anymore. At least they've changed a great deal. Now, now one of the ways that you know you can take a look at how things have changed is if you go to the B two C model and you go to the business to consumer model to see how consumer spending has changed because consumers because they are buying online they're doing other things uh, online they end up going into offices and they sit at cubicles and desks and they buy things in the business as well they are business buyers so you know out of about 1100 malls in America Amazon and other online buyers uh, buying organizations and buying sites have created an environment where over 300 of those malls are going to close by the end of this decade. And just this year alone, 21 retailers, uh, traditional brick and mortar retailers, announced the closure of about 3,500 uh, stores uh, in the in the United States. Uh, it's becoming it's becoming drastically clear to those looking at um, looking at the B2C model. That things have changed and they're never going back to the way they were. I'm a child of the 70s and 80s, so going to the mall with my friends, being dropped off by my parents, was a rite of passage. It's no longer a rite of passage because the mall simply isn't there anymore. Um, McKinsey and Company actually did a, uh, you know, actually released a report a little while back talking about the evolution of B2C sales and what it means to B&B. There is a disruptive new sales model that's going on, and anyone on this call who's dealing with B2B and uh, dealing with buyers you, you probably understands that. That digital enabled enterprise sales is really starting to resemble a B2C e-commerce model, where our large enterprise customers can look up, can test, can find out all about our products without ever stepping away from their computer and more importantly without ever talking to us. Now, now 
when you think about your customer, when you think about the customer that we have, that I have traditionally talked to, it's a customer that needed to talk to me as a salesperson to be to understand exactly what it was they had a problem with. It was consultative selling, the ability to inform, to provide insight, to improve, you know, that was all on a one-to-one -one basis. The problem is that technology has changed and our customers are now used to going online, going to third-party review sites and finding out information, finding out problems, solutions, and even pricing way before they even talk to us. So our traditional way of going out and selling to these people, whether it be outbound, whether it be inside sale, you know, however we do these things, it's not necessarily because our product or service doesn't work. It's because, or, or that our product or service doesn't offer value. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we offering value as salespeople in the process? Is there anything that I'm doing in the sales process that cannot be done by a website, that cannot be done by a third-party review site, that cannot be done? Uh, by uh, by another piece of technology and that's the question we really need to ask ourselves because as we move forward and we look at the state of B2B sales we find out that 70 percent of buyers our buyers use social media as a research tool over half of them just go into their own social networks LinkedIn Facebook all these others to engage their peers in conversations about products and solutions 65% of buyers that actually bought something from somebody in the B2B space said the winning vendor's content had a significant impact on their purchase. And 91% of B2B buyers have increased their expectations of vendors and salespeople in the last two years. So I know I talked a lot about content and, 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 and we're going to talk a lot about content here, providing content as part of being a marketer. But I'm sure you're probably thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, isn't that what marketing is for? Isn't marketing responsible for carrying the message out to prospects, to suspects, and then once they're interested, we can go ahead and reel them in as salespeople? Well, the issue with that is marketing has always been a one-to-many conversation. Pepsi is the choice of the new generation, right? Where is the beef? Have it your way. These are marketing slogans. These are ways that, that, that one marketer has communicated a brand to a whole bunch of people. But for you people that are sitting in this webinar that sales, you know that sales is not that one-to-many. It's one-to-one -one conversations. And marketing messages don't work in the sales space. And that's the issue we're having. I mean, I can talk. I can. I can name 50 salespeople I've talked to in the last two weeks that are having a problem with leads generated from marketing. And the reason is, is because those conversations are 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 not valuable. Marketing is not equipped to go ahead and have a one-to-one -one conversation with a, with an individual or to communicate something one-to-one. -one. And marketing has always been, marketing has always been, again, a, 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 a monologue, not a dialogue. There was nobody back in the day to communicate to Pepsi to say, well, wait a minute, I'm part of this new generation and I don't like Pepsi. Or there was nobody out there to say, well, you know, McDonald's has pretty good beef and their hamburgers too. But now with the advent of social media and a number of different uh, avenues in which to communicate, people can literally tell Pepsi what's up with their marketing. And they can go to Wendy's and they can say, well, wait a minute, you know, In-N-Out Burger is a lot better. And they can tweet that, it can go viral, and then all of a sudden you have a marketing nightmare. So really when it comes down to the social aspect of, of the way we communicate, marketing, proof marketing, or the ability, what I call smarketing, and then we're going to talk about it, is eating sales. And it's eating all traditional marketing. And what you have to ask yourself as a 21st century salesperson in 2017 is are you casting your lot with the traditional way of doing business? Uh, you call it the dinosaur way of doing business. Or are you going to be an astronaut attempting to go out and search for new worlds and, and new life and new civilizations? Because that's the choice we're left with here and 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 to illustrate that to illustrate that Baylor University did a, a study on the effectiveness of cold calling and traditional cold calling 
right? And they took a look and they had 6,200 calls that were made by sales professionals, outbound sales professionals. And they wanted to drill down and find out how valuable this traditional way of prospecting was to the new buyer in the new normal. So what did that look like? Well, at the end of the day, 17% of the numbers in the list just didn't work. 55% over half were either ring no answers or voicemails. 28% they actually answered, but out of that 28%, 91% out of that 28% wanted no further information, they didn't want to talk to them, they hung up. So what you're left with is the number of conversations that were had was less than a half, but was about a half a percent. That's what's effective in traditional outbound marketing or traditional outbound cold calling. And this is across, all, the, although this industry was real estate, this is across multiple industries. And anybody that spent any time on the phone recently, you know, can basically tell you the same. Now, this is not to say that, it, that, that inbound marketing is all that much better when you're talking about uh, inside sales. And quite honestly, I like to point this out, that uh, when it comes to cold calling, uh, no one's ever called me to sell me cold calling training. It's kind of funny that I always hear about how effective cold calling training is from uh, social uh, posts and on my Twitter feed, on my LinkedIn feed, uh, in webinars, those types of things. Um, I never hear about that when, someone, when I pick up the phone and someone tells me how important it is. But to that end, let's not say web-generated leads are all that much better because quite honestly, there was another study done by Inside Sales, and it was reported in Harvard Business Review, right? Where the picture was they took 100,000 calls based on 15,000 leads. They said the secret sauce, the secret sauce to making that web-generated lead work was to call that individual six times. And, and, and they educated us in saying, well, you had to call at either 8 o'clock or 4 o'clock. And out of those 10,000 calls, you would literally connect with and make contact with 9,800. So that's really a less than 10% success rate. And the reason I put success in a question mark there is that we're just talking about contacts. We're not even moving through a conversation or having, does someone want to talk about something with us? We're literally to the point right now when, we're, when, when, when we are either traditionally prospecting outbound or we're dealing with web-generated leads, that contact the ability to talk to someone counts as a particular metric. And I laugh and I say, what's next? Are we going to start counting verbals as KPIs in our CRM? So, so what, we're, what we're left with, with with this traditional area is to go ahead and say, well, just being lucky enough to talk to someone is valuable. Now, you may be thinking, well, this and this, that's not what my sales trainer told me. My sales trainer tells me that I need to just keep keep on keeping on. I need to keep the hustle and grit going. I need to go ahead and stay on the phone. I need to hit it harder in order to do that. Well, 90% of the companies that invest in sales training, less than 6% see long-term behavioral changes in their people, right? And 75% of reps out there think that their approach is better and different than the competition, but when you talk to their customers, only 3% of their customers agree. And only 6% of reps after training exceed expectations. 48% don't exceed at all. The 80-20 rule at the end still applies. 80% of the sales, after, after 20 years of solution selling, of challenger selling, of spin selling, of Dale Carnegie, of, every, of, 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 of Sandler, of everything within the sales training industry, we're still looking at 20% of the salespeople making 80% of the sales. And when it comes down to it, less than 50% of sales reps are actually making their quota. So you may be saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, Derek. You know, the sales gurus, they're just telling me to keep my head down and hustle. Basically do what we've always done because grit always works. Grit will beat out talent. Hard work will beat out talent. We hear that all the time, right? What I'm just doing is this sounds like a lot of scaremongering that I'm talking about. Uh, the end of sales, or the you know the 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 end of uh, you know the end of the tradition of B two B sales. Well, you know, let's talk about disaster movies because in every disaster movie, there's usually someone with facts, figures, and experience who's being ignored, and not until the very end, until the earth is delicate is is left in the balance, do they listen to those individuals or do they listen to that information 
that's there. Now, I'm not saying I'm Randy Quaid and I've been picked up by uh, aliens, but what I am saying is there are facts, there are figures, there are there's information out there, and if you don't believe anything that I'm talking about up to this point within uh, within this presentation, I urge you to talk to your own customers or talk to your own family. Find out exactly how they buy, what they like to buy, how they like to interact, because I I will I'll bet you a dollar to a donut that you're going to be hearing a lot of the same information from them. And we can't be so centrally focused on our own selves and our own quotas and our own numbers to ignore what's going on around us, to ignore the signs that are out there. The signs are there. And by the signs, I mean signs in the news. I mean the ability to say when you're looking at major enterprise sellers out there of software, of other technology, 50% of their revenue is being spent on sales and marketing alone. To ramp up a brand new salesperson at HP, IBM, or Oracle, it costs them $500,000 that first year to go ahead and bring that person up. But Forrester is looking at this model and they're saying, you know what? 23% of these B2B salespeople are going to be gone in the next couple of years. Now, is that scaremongering? I don't know, because when you take a look at what's happened in the last couple of months, just in 2017, major organizations have let go of a lot of salespeople. And more importantly, even smaller organizations have laid off a larger percentage of their salespeople. And it's all moving toward a different model. It's all moving toward a different model. And I really do believe the model is data-driven. The model is data-driven because customers are saying, our salespeople are not prepared to talk business the way we want to when we finally engage with them. And that's the issue that's going on. And that's why we have to evolve from traditional salespeople into what I deem as a smarter. Because at the end of the day, 90% of buyers are telling us that when they are ready, they will find us. Now, whether or not that's the case is an argument for another day, but this is how they feel. So for us, we have to make it easy for them to find us. And let's just go back to leaving this to marketing, leaving this to other people. If you are a quota-driven salesperson, if you make your house payment or your car payment or anything else based upon the numbers that you make and the income that you bring in, why would you leave that up to someone else in another department that doesn't have any skin in the game? Why would you leave that to a marketer? in order to bring in leads to you? Why would you lead that to an SDR in order to bring you in qualified leads? At the end of the day, we are responsible, and I am responsible for creating t the demand and generating the demand for the product and the solutions that I go ahead and provide. So th that's all well and good, right? That's all well and good, but we take a look at the way sales and marketing have traditionally worked. And marketing is that big kind of information uh, uh, outreach that gets prospects interested. And then sales is usually working separate from marketing, and all the wheels turn, right? And this is exactly how marketing gets people interested. Sales calls them. There's outbound sales. Oh, the prospect, yes, I have heard of Xerox. I have heard of Rico or Microsoft or or ABC company. And uh, yes, I am interested in saving 30% or more on my car insurance. You know, however that, how, whatever that pitch is, that's the traditional way it's worked. But what we've shown is that that traditional way isn't, isn't necessarily working anymore. And we're not having these conversations, or at least not the number or the quality of conversations we used to have. And when over almost 60% of our customers say they prefer not to interact with us, until they do their own research online. Why are we leaving that initial conversation with a marketer or with an SDR to have that communication? I know as a person who's been in sales for 20 years that my initial conversation with a, with a client or a prospect, even a suspect, is the most important one. It's the absolute most important one because from that conversation, I will then, we will then determine how that relationship moves forward. Why, if I'm a quota-bearing salesperson, would I leave that conversation to someone else? And that's what smarketing is. Smarketing is the ability to go ahead and take a look at that traditional model and say, you know what, I am no longer just a salesperson, I am a smarketer. And I'm going to work with my prospects 
and with customer success, my own internal customer success, to walk my, my prospect and my customer through a buying process. And in the next webinar, we'll talk a little bit about the influence of customer success on, the, on, on smarketing. But what we're really talking about today here is that big blue wheel, the smarketer wheel, and how we do that, and how we go ahead and create, and we make that easy button for our clients in order to do that. Now, traditionally, and not traditionally, like in the last year or so, smarketing has been the merging of departments or the communication between two departments, specifically sales and marketing. And if you take the word smarketing and you type it in your Google machine, you'll find all kinds of articles on how your sales department needs to better interact with your marketing department and so on and so forth. This is now me personally, this is anyone else coming up with this conversation here, but I personally think that that model is uh, unsustainable. I think traditional sales and traditional marketing working together is an unsustainable because they are each have different audiences, they each have different practices, they each have different communication styles, and they're each paid differently. So getting them in the same line, getting them on the same sheet of music is of course incredibly difficult because they're doing two different things. So that's why I believe to succeed Smarketing needs to become an individual practice. It needs to become something that you do as a sales professional, as a traditional sales professional, as opposed to something that you've went ahead and uh, provided into two different departments. So after all the rigmarole, what at the end of the day is a smarketer, Derek? What does a smarketer actually do and how do I go ahead and evolve into one? How do I become one? Well, first, what I believe a smarketer is, is they are a subject matter expert in the market and industry that they sell into. No longer are they just simply the person that knows their product the best, that has the best way to overcome objections, that's the best on the phone, that sends the best emails, prospecting, all of that stuff is, you know, is relatively important. But, at the, but, but really what matters is the knowledge and the expertise you have in the market in which you operate. If you sell shoes, you need to know the most about feet. If you sell software, you need to know most about the problems that your software addresses and the people that have the problems that your software addresses. So that's the first thing. You have to be what I call, or what Microsoft deemed the SME, a subject matter expert. You have to be a content author. And I know this is a big one for a lot of uh, salespeople out there. It's like, well, I don't have time to enter, you know, write content or create content. I don't know where to start. Um, if you haven't already started, you're behind the eight ball. And uh, I would suggest you, you know, you jump on it. And I'll talk a little bit how to go ahead and become a content author. But again, if over half of your traditional customers are out there looking at content online before they even think about talking to you, why are you leaving that conversation to someone else? You shouldn't. You wouldn't set an appointment with someone and then send someone else to that first appointment. That would be suicidal as far as a quota bearing salesperson. So why are you sending that, why are you letting that happen with, uh, uh, with the first communication you have, which is that online communication? You also have to be a customer experience advocate. I'm going to go a little bit deeper into that there. But what, a, but what I mean by that is you have to understand what the customer experience is, not only of the solution or the product that you are, per, are that you are selling, but also the way in which your prospective customer deals with your organization, deals with your company, deals with your brand, and you have to be and you have to understand it. You have to be part of it. A couple other things: you have to be a strategic communicator. You know, you have to be able to know when to talk about what and at what time throughout the process. Because the process is no longer the selling process. The selling process, 1997 called and they want their uh, terminology back. There is no selling process. It's now all about the buyer's journey. And the buyer's journey has different parts and we'll go into those different parts. And you need to understand with your subject matter expertise, with your content authorship and with your customer experience advocacy, where to take those narratives and put them strategically when you're communicating to your prospects and your client. And you have to be a custodian of that buyer's journey. We're going to talk a little bit about why I use the word custodian in that aspect. And at the end, what all of this means 
And all of this means is you have to become a modern prospector because what I believe truly is what you're looking at right now is modern sales prospecting. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that can actually turn into uh, business opportunities for you. So what a smarketer is not, what a smarketer is not, and this may shock you know, a few people on the webinar, but what a smarketer is not, a smarketer is not a closer. Selling-centric focus selling doesn't play anymore, uh, it, either in the B2C or the B2B process. Um, Sales reps no longer have the power or have limited power within the process. It's all been tilted toward the buyer. With all of the ability to have information online, buyers are far savvier than they used to be. You can no longer look at your client as a pile of money. And that's what closing, rep, that's what focusing on the close, focusing on that process has meant in the past, is, 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 is that level of high pressure selling to close them, get them to sign on the line which is dotted. It's no longer the case. Customers are rejecting that. They're rejecting it in, they're rejecting it in droves. That's why nobody goes to Circuit City anymore to buy televisions. They do that online or they go on cost or they go to Costco where there's nobody there trying to sell them anything on commission. High pressure sales. So put that coffee down. There are no more closers. So that's great. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for destroying everything about sales, Derek, in this uh, presentation. How do I become a, you know, how do I become a smarter? How do I start? How do I become a SME, a SME, a subject matter expert? How do I do these things? Well, you probably kind of this. A lot of this stuff is going to be pretty self-explanatory, but I really want to kind of delve deep into it. Um, you exist in a, at a time in 2017 where you, as an individual human being, have more access to human knowledge than any other person that has ever lived before in the 5,000 or so odd years of recorded human history or however that is. You have the ability to become a subject matter expert in anything you want simply by pointing and clicking on your, on your desktop and looking and reading and consuming information. There is no reason why any of us cannot be a subject matter expert now with all of the information at our fingertips. We also have our customers there and our customers there to willing to have conversations with us about what's important to them. We, pr we, we routinely in sales are always thinking of the new, always thinking of the upgrade, always thinking of, of, uh, of, how, of, of, of how to get more of something. If we can go ahead and mine our current customer base and have real conversations about what's important with them, what's important to their process, what's, what are some of their insights and what are some of the things that they're thinking about? Um, the ability when, con when, when putting that in conjunction with uh, information that's available out there in the public by other experts, uh, it's a fantastic one-two punch when you're trying to deliver insights. And then you have to know what's going on in your industry and what's going on in your competitors and who your competitors are and what they're offering and where they're falling down and where they're not falling down. I tell a story on LinkedIn where I was at a trade show event and one of my competitors, uh, I'd, uh, I met someone who was working with one of my competitors and quite honestly uh, they said, uh, uh, they, they told me a story about how they tweeted something on the competitor's uh, Twitter and there was no response and it was a customer uh, experience issue that they had and nobody responded uh, you know, to that. Uh, why isn't your, you know, so if your competitors aren't responding to tweets about customer success, maybe that's something that you can become an expert in, 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 in solving that need and the ability to communicate how your brand does it differently. You have to know what's going on in your industry. Um, you can no longer, and again, this is going to come as a shock to people, but uh, in the sales industry, but you have to put down the how to sell books. You have to put down the, um, uh, the how to prospect, how to do this, how to do that. You have to be willing to go ahead and learn about your industry more and learn about what, you know, what you're selling in. Um, we've traditionally always concentrated on the skill of selling, but the skill of selling is now something for the most part is socially unacceptable. 
there are countries in in this world that are outlawing cold calls on the commercial side or excuse me on the consumer side so people don't pick up the phone and call people at home to sell them things people these people have jobs and they work in companies uh, they don't communicate this way anymore they want to communicate a different way and either we can continue to do the things we've always done or we can move into the different model well that's great uh, how do I become a content author? How, how, how do I go ahead now and take this uh, SME ship, this subject matter expertise, and facilitate the ability to deliver content? Well, again, you at this time in human history have uh, the ability to publish virtually anything you want to an unlimited number of, of people and prospects and suspects just by simply sitting where you are right now and clicking on a web page and doing that. We're going to talk, you know, whether it be Facebook or LinkedIn or Quora or in, or YouTube or Instagram or a number of different uh, places, you have the ability to provide that content out there. So if if you're if you're not developing content right now, and, and content can be anything. Content can be a tweet. Content can be an article, long-form article. Content can be a video on how you were able to go ahead and save your customer 30% or more on car insurance. Again, it's all about your subject matter expertise, understanding what your customers want to hear, and then giving it to them. And you personally giving it to them, not outsourcing this to marketing or to some other entity uh, and then waiting for the leads to come in because as we know all of us here in this meeting and all of us here in B2B sales uh, the leads are weak the leads are weak for marketing they always have been they always will be so the fact of the matter is is that unless we take the reins of that ourselves um, we're not prepared for we're not prepared for the uh, for the future Customer experience advocate. Well, how do I become a customer experience advocate? And what really does that mean, customer experience ad advocacy? Well, your customer, again, will tell you what they like and what they don't like about their competitors, about our market, about anything else. If you go in LinkedIn and you take a look and just do a search on cold calling posts, on posts about B2B sales cold calling, invariably you will get pro articles and con articles. But if you go in the comments, you'll see a whole bunch of salespeople weighing in one way or another and then the diamonds in the rough are the information you get from customers the ones that start out I'm not a salesperson but or I'm a buyer for an engineering firm and this is what I think and when you read that information when you read your customers Twitter feeds when you read their Facebook feeds when you see the kind of questions they're asked they're asking on Quora and what they're posting on you know on on Instagram and 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 everything else you understand what their you know what their not only what their problems are but what their experiences are within um, within your market and within your addressable market and again and again focuses on customer you also have an entity most likely in your organization that deals with customers and you should be talking to them you should be interacting with them I go so far as here at Zinbit I wrote an article about this a little while back all of our sales personnel and our salespeople and people that have forward-facing, customer-facing uh, sales positions take a, 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 a take a turn on the help desk, take a turn on our customer success desk every single month, and for a couple of hours they answer chat, they answer calls, they answer chats, they understand, and this rolls up all the way to me. Uh, I go ahead and do this once a month and the reason I do this is so I understand from a from a base level not because somebody told me but from a base level of what my customers are going through the experience they have not only with my product but with the problems that they have out there and with our own organization and only then once I know about these types of things can I become an advocate for the type of experience I want my customers to have Well, how do I take all this and then learn how to strategically communicate it, right? How do I how do I know when to talk about certain things, certain stuff, and things to people? Well, again, understanding our customers 
the mar it's out there. It's out there. It's kind of like the truth is out there, right? The the old X Files. The truth is out there. We just have to be willing to look for it. You have to be willing to go ahead and look and see what people are talking about. And again, the multitude of customers that you have, the different people within the organizations that you're talking to, and really where what their individual buyer journeys are what the buyer journey for the organization is and we're going to talk a little bit about this in the next part as part of being a custodian of the buying journey but your buyers the people that you sell to have a process and you can do one of two things you can try to take that square peg and jam it in your triangle hole of your selling process whatever it may be or you can figure out a way to go ahead and, be, and take that subject matter expertise and that content and that customer advocacy and go ahead and strategically insert it and insert these communication points in different parts of their buyer's journey in order to go ahead and facilitate their, them coming at the end when they make that decision, making the decision for you as opposed to making a decision for someone else. You have to listen very carefully what I'm going to say right now. Not everything is about us, about our sales number, about our quotas, about the commission we're making, about our forecast, about our pipeline. There has never been a customer who has cared about any of that, although that's what we're obsessed with, many of us, on a daily basis. We have to retune our focus and understand that if we can become truly customer-centric, we can go ahead and become people that are that are listening and not just talking about ourselves. And again, the ability to strategically communicate this starts with understanding this particular journey. And not only understanding it, but becoming a custodian of it. And so I and again I chose the word custodian on purpose, not because I think we should be cleaning up after our customers, but because I think the the other the other way uh, the other definition of uh, custodian. We need to be a person who has the responsibility or is looking after our buyer's journey. Our buyer's journey is the most important journey for them and for us that they're going to take within our relationship. And if we're constantly trying to force them into our selling process, we're not a custodian of their journey. Now, this journey is, is, is pretty general. What you're looking at here, you may have, your customers may have a different journey. Your market may have a different journey. The ability for you to understand that journey and accept it is the first step in becoming a custodian of that particular journey. The acceptance is the key. I know we all work for managers, we all work for organizations, we, we know we have our own selling process and our own qualification process, and I'm not saying you have to throw yourself in front of the juggernaut and push back on your boss or push back on your organization. What I am selling is you have to understand that they're interested in a sale, and you, we need to be interested in the furtherance of our career and surviving in the world as it is now. And the world as it is, is a buyer-centric world. So understanding their journey and bringing it onto ourselves is probably the most important thing that we, can, that we can do. And again, it's a building block process. We don't get to understand the buyer's journey until we become a subject matter expert, until we go ahead and, uh, and uh, you, know, from, you, know, from, you know, from that become, uh, uh, become a content author. And you know, while we're authoring that content, talking about customer advocacy and, building, and being able to strategically communicate. All of that is part and parcel of building into the customer or to the custodian of the buyer's journey. And at the end of this trail, at the end of this trail um, is, is, is what we really want to become, is a modern prospector, is the ability to prospect and do the types of things that, that create the, the, not just the leads, but to create and to, uh, the, to generate the demand out there not only for our product and service that we provide and we sell, but also for ourselves. Because, because I know everybody talks about relationship selling and how it's about the relationship, but who do we have relationships with? Do we have relationships with the people at McDonald's or Burger King or KFC or some other transactional place where we say, I want three things and a side of fries, and they say, here you go, 
and they go ahead and take our money and give us our change. Do we have relationships with those people? Or do we have relationships with people that provide us real value and real insight into not their process, but into our own process, right? So when it comes to modern prospecting, what we really have to do, and again, you know, I use a lot of the same imagery here, but it all begins in that social media space, is the ability to go ahead and research and find out and share and become uh, uh, an expert within your particular uh, 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 practice, within your particular vertical, within your particular uh, marketplace. And it doesn't have to be a lot. Let's not, let's not confuse this with the fact that you need 10,000 followers on Twitter to be an effective prospector, right? Um, this isn't cold calling. This isn't, you don't need to make 10,000 calls to talk to 100 people. This isn't sending out 50,000 emails to get a couple people interested. This is the ability where you send out content and from that content, someone likes it, someone comments on it, someone shares it. All you need is one or two to create that relationship. If you write a piece of content on LinkedIn and three people comment on it, those are three potential prospects that you should be dealing with, that you should be talking to, that you should then engage with and go ahead and engage in a process. That's modern prospecting. It's not talking to people that don't want to talk to us. It's talking to people that have already engaged with us, and we can only do that through social. Right? When I call someone on the phone, you know, people look at the caller ID, they go, oh, I don't want to talk to Zenbit. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to sell them to sell me anything. But when someone reads one of my posts or listens to one of my webinars and communicates with me afterwards, uh, that is potentially that is potentially a much uh, a much better prospect. They're no longer a suspect; they're a prospect. They have interest. And again, when I build into that, my customers can provide. If I've done all of this right, and if I've went ahead and created customers that know I'm a subject matter expert, that love my content, that uh, know I'm an advocate for their customer experience, that understand without a doubt that I know how to strategically communicate and effectively be a custodian of their buyer's journey, they're going to refer me to like-minded individuals in their network. And the referral business becomes an actual ability for you to go ahead and utilize current customers, your current customers, because you've controlled the whole communication up to that point. And you can co and they'll come to you and they'll provide you real referrals. Not call this guy because I think you know he should, but real referrals. Because remember that slide at the very beginning, the vast majority of people go to their own social networks to talk about brands, to talk about solutions. So you should be building these customers throughout this process. Because remember, buyers will consume up to 60 pieces of content before reaching out to a salesperson. So if you're a modern prospector, and again, I know I hit this nail a couple of times directly on the head, but why are you outsourcing that content to someone else who doesn't have any skin in the game as opposed to the value of that content out there? Now, I talk a lot about this in the other Sales Hacker uh, webinars. You can go to zinbit.com slash blog, and uh, you can take a look at, uh, at, at how you can create some of this content. Uh, I go, I deep dive into these uh, in in, into these uh, um, uh, ways of going ahead and becoming a modern prospector. And you can take a look at those there. Now, being a smarketer, again, it's all about these six things, I believe. And they are not one-offs. You can't do one and not the other. They build upon each other. It all starts with subject matter expertise in which you build content. And that content and that expertise demands that you become a customer experience advocate. Once you know all of those things, you can strategically communicate parts of what you need to communicate in your customer's buyer's journey. And then at the end of the day, you are a modern prospector. You are a smarketer. And again, this is, a, uh, this is an entity where uh, this is a person that I believe, and again, this is just me, um, uh, talking, talking to you here, but I believe that this is the, this is the future of sales. These are the people that are going to remain after the big, big call, as Graham Hawkins talks about it, the big call, as Forrester says, all of those B2B salespeople are going to be let go. These are the people that are going to remain, the people that can merge traditional marketing with sales and communicate as a singular entity. 
because really this is the person our customers want to have a relationship with. It's not an SDR. It's not a person who's just an account executive. It's not a person who's a marketer. It's this, it's this kind of hybrid individual, this evolutionary, this is the top of the food chain. This is what we're evolving to. At least I believe so. So tools and links to start your evolution into marketing. Well, a lot of it has already been talked about, but the very first is you have to find those insights. You have to take the time, whether it's your own time, whether it's company time. I'm not going to tell you how to spend your days as far as you know what you're doing throughout the day, but you need to find time to create and find your own insights and to build yourself as a smarketer. And once you do that, there are a multitude of different mediums in which you can go ahead and share information, whether it be written, whether it be video, whether it be audio. You have the ability, I think Quora, the big Q there, if you take a look, that is a big underutilized um, uh, aspect where you can literally become an expert in a certain in a, in, in a certain subject and people will rate your answers up and down and the more and the better you're rated the more people will ask you. I've gotten business off of Quora, off of answering people's questions um, that had to do with what we do which is interacting with uh, Salesforce and dealing with uh, um, um, you know and, and, uh, and dealing with Salesforce and making Salesforce work for you in your organization. Um, your own websites, your own websites have uh, your company's websites has a whole uh, ability to go ahead and provide you provide you insights and provide your customers insights. You should take uh, a look at what's going on on your websites and inform your organization whether or not that's working and I know that's hard I know that's uh, kind of sometimes it's um, kind of like leaning up against the wind trying to get something done there but it is worth your time in order because that is still the main way prospects will look at you and your organization before they talk to you which is your website and if you don't feel good about the content on your website if you don't think the stuff from marketing that they put up there is actually helping at all why are you why are you uh, why are you there why are you letting that letting that dictate your process because if you feel that information is weak if the if the if the main way people think about you you feel is weak um, that's an issue and that's a problem and a lot of this falls down from that aspect and then there's there are packages like we have Zinbit which not only interact with Salesforce but provide you a lot of tracking capabilities and how people are looking at your content how people are looking you know what you know what people are interested in your blog posts what people are interested in your in your uh, pages on your website so on and so forth the most important thing and I think uh, anybody that has read my articles or listened to any of these webinars, I'm tired of the glib generalizations about sales and selling. I'm, uh, I think it's a little long in the tooth to be talking about hustle and grit and uh, only the strong survive and we're all wolves and everybody's a deer and all these other things. Um, sales is extremely complex and it's ever changing. And unless you're trying to sell sales training or a sales book or something else like that, that doesn't really help. That doesn't really help. I can't tell you if you're here on this call um, whether or not uh, this process or what process will work for your selling because some of you are selling software, some of you are selling industrial machines, some of you uh, are selling other things. You understand that. So, so I'm not going to make a glib generalization to tell you, well, you should never call people on the phone or inbound sales doesn't work for you. It may, it may not. I know what the general consensus is. But what I am saying is, is we have to invest in ourselves and invest in our own expertise uh, more importantly than just being a generalist. Graham Hawkins, again, said it in his book, The Future of Sales. The sales generalists are the ones that are going to die off. Specializing specializing in customer insights, specializing in customer experience, specializing in strategically guiding someone through their own buyer's journey. Those are the people that are going to be left at the end, uh, at the end of the big call. Um, I do have a quote from Winston Churchill here and I kind of utilize for this particular, I don't think this is the end of B2B sales, right? I don't think this is even the beginning of the end. This is the end of the beginning. We have traditionally sold this way because that's the way we could work in the physical world. 
and technology kind of came in and there were phones and there were other things that we could do but the j-curve of technology in the last 15 or 20 years has drastically changed the way people sell it's changing our physical landscape it's changing the malls of America are disappearing Main Street gave way to Walmart and now Walmart's closing the way people buy the way people interact um, you know people aren't getting carpal tunnel in their wrists anymore they're getting it in their necks this is what doctors are saying because they're looking down on their smartphones and on their tablets it's physically changing our the way we feel in our bodies the technology is so the fact is this is the end of the beginning of traditional b2b sales and what we're brought into is a new world a new way of doing this and I truly believe that this marketing the melding of traditional marketing and sales is the way in which we can not only survive the new normal but we can go ahead and succeed in the new normal um, to the end of that I put my money where my mouth is here so I know this is a webinar this is kind of one way this is uh, this is kind of broadcast I'll go ahead and anyone who has taken this uh, 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 webinar and who's interested in anything that I've talked about if you're if if you're willing to give me a little of your time I'm willing to give you a little of my insight of what value it is is up to you uh, personally so if you want to take a 30-minute mentor session with me, you sit around, you go to that link, you can go ahead and choose 30 minutes to sit down with me. We'll talk about your market. We'll talk about how you can become a subject matter expert. We'll talk about how to evolve to a smarter. We'll talk about whether or not you can within your industry. Again, it's your time. It's something that I offer as a value add. We won't demo Zinbit. We won't talk about my software. That's for other meetings. This is specifically professional development to help you uh, move forward uh, and and be one of the ones that stick around after after the big call now with that uh, that is uh, I, I'll go ahead and uh, we've got a couple minutes left so that's the end of the uh, end of the webinar if there are any questions um, you can feel free to go ahead and ask some questions here so we have we do it looks like we have one question how do you hire a new sales rep by this definition of smart which would traditionally be put in an account management customer relations role that is a great question answer is we don't and what do I mean by that uh, there's going to be an article coming out on the sales hacker website very shortly where we go this in great detail but at Zinbit we don't hire traditional salespeople we don't have a model in which SDRs make calls to set up meetings and then they transfer these to a business development person and they are on a they're in a compensation with a quota and they go ahead and they have to meet their quota everything else we have general organizational numbers that we need to meet for revenue for revenue for new customer acquisition but they are organizational our salespeople our SDRs our customer success people our developers everyone is paid a great base salary but they're also paid revenue bonuses they're also paid revenue percentages and the way we do that is that we go ahead and when we bring people in everybody's responsible for that in the everybody's responsible for marketing everybody's responsible for sales now for smaller organizations as we are that works but as we're growing we're finding it the ability to scale that and the reason we're scaling it that way is because we've determined as an organization that sales commissions are a detriment to this type of marketing uh, um, uh, model because if your salesperson is concentrating on a quota concentrating on a number they're going to go ahead and do what needs to be done to make that number regardless of the experience regardless of everything and this is not saying anything bad about salespeople I was been a quoted uh, carrying salesperson for years I carried a quota for years I carried incredibly large quotas and then when I was a director at Xerox I managed a national team that had you know uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars of quota um, in each particular uh, geographic region right so so it's not necessarily that I don't know about quotas or quotas don't work or quotas don't um, quotas don't uh, 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 you know uh, aren't realistic but for our model what we've done is we've accepted the fact that we have regular numbers that we want to make as an organization and we go ahead and move everyone toward making that so the customer journey 
is the most important. So when they're first reached out to through marketing, when they're brought in through sales, when they're transferred over to customer success in the trial process, when they have fulfillment, everything else is modeled after that. And again, for those of you on this webinar, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit, uh, or you, there'll be an article that'll be released very shortly that'll go deeper into that. But that's basically how it works. It's very difficult to become a marketer in a traditional role. And it's something that we have to end up doing ourselves. And it's something that I did myself while I was at Xerox and uh, that I evolved into as far as in this position that I hold at Zinbit right now. But if you look at my articles, if you look at my social media profiles and everything else, you'll notice that I started all of this while I was still a director at Xerox. Even though Xerox gave me no insight, no really permission in order to do it, I determined that it was something I needed to do in order to survive. Uh, the next question would be Derek. Uh, oh, I hope I answered that question. And if you have another question on that a aspect, you can definitely answer me or you know, ask via email or you know sign up for a mentor session. Derek, can you share your opinions on when now vendor organizations will catch on to this shift and modify both the onboarding process and the compensation plans? Where I'm going with this is a lot of these our green uh, our greenfield starter roles as a setup fail because often a way of rep learns to be a subject matter expert is learning from and a, yes and a different account Ex yes I I believe that that the subject matter oh, this is kind of what I believe about uh, about the way people are hired in startups and that um, I believe the whole SDR model and the traditional SDR model, the one that's been working in, in definitely in SaaS for a little while, that I think it's flawed. I think it's not only flawed in the sense that it's uh, it's 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 outbound heavy, but I also think it's flawed in a sense that we have our lowest skilled people having the very first conversation with an with an individual. And if we do believe, as all of us are told, that the first conversation is the most important, our models need to change. Um, the people that talk to our customers first here at Zinbit are the most knowledgeable. They are the highest paid. They are the ones that have the most industry knowledge, that are the subject matter experts. Uh, in my case, the ones that have the grayest hair. I mean, these are the people that we make responsible for the first communication to our particular clients. They're the ones that write the content. They're the ones that manage the marketing. They're the ones that go out there and do that. And the reason is, is because that individual communication is so incredibly important. As the customer is involved and brought into, uh, or as they're brought into our process or we kind of meld with their process, then they deal with what are traditionally known as SDRs, but we kind of call them uh, process concierges. And what they do then is they, th those people, are 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 not lower tier employees, but they're less experienced employees. But what they are experienced in is is the trial process, managing someone's trial software process, managing someone through their buyer's journey in order to go ahead and get them to go from a trial to becoming a paid customer, so on and so forth. And as those people gain that expertise, they can evolve into a first tier salesperson, reach out person. I so believe in prospecting as the primary thing a salesperson should do, I want to take everything else off of their plate. A salesperson should only be generating demand, bringing people into the top of the funnel. After that, they should be handed off to a machine, to a process that can manage the trial, manage the proposal, manage the pricing, uh, uh, pricing and in the end manage the uh, manage the signing of the contract and the fulfillment and everything else. So we truly believe that, and we've built an engine um, to that uh, from that aspect. Uh, let's see here. I have another question. How do you get companies to buy into an individual um, contributor in an SDR role? Well, comp oh, how do you get company buy-in as an individual contributor uh, in a lead SDR role? That's a that's a that is um, that's the sticky wicket, isn't it? If you're if you're an SDR, 
and if you are trying to get you know buy-in to this to this level of process how do you do it within your organization well the very first thing is is this webinar is recorded um, all of the data that I have on the webinar is in hyperlinks at the bottom of each page so if you want to go ahead and pull together that data that information for the people you need to talk to that works as well but I've often noted that data data gets information but often more more often than that stories do the ability to go ahead and communicate I um, uh, this process and try to sell it internally I will tell you this I'll be realistic I'm not a sales trainer I'm not going to tell you if you make a thousand phone calls uh, a day you're gonna you know uh, have a boat uh, have a 40-foot yacht and you know you're gonna be uh, um, you know uh, lighting uh, cigars made of hundred dollar bills with fifty dollar bills I'm not going to go ahead and um, and uh, and uh, and uh, blow wind on you that uh, that way I'll be honest with you this is a hard sell for many different organizations and at Xerox I tried to go ahead and sell this internally this was before Xerox split up and uh, I tried to sell this internally I was brought in by an or part of an organization that really wanted this kind of selling this kind of this kind of prospecting this kind of uh, um, this kind of model and I was I was I was literally pushed down and beat down every single moment uh, of that particular experience um, but it didn't uh, again it didn't dissuade me for doing it myself and every time I heard no I just redoubled down and did that and maybe at the end of the day that's how we take no for don't take no for an answer it's not so much taking no for an answer from our internal customers or our external customers it's taking no for an answer from our internal people the people we, we, we report to and the people our people report to our, our bosses report to because really those are the those are the people we have to sell on this you will never have to sell a customer on marketing that's what they want the people you have to sell are internal to your organization and again um, we can definitely talk about that uh, in a sales hacker session we can talk a little bit about what's going on in your organization and we can uh, you know and I can give you feedback and a little bit of insight on how to go ahead and do that will everyone be successful in selling this to that organization I'm not gonna lie to you probably not but at the end of the day and I, I know I say end of the day a lot but at the very end of the day you're responsible for you and we are responsible for ourselves and whether you're working at your current organization or whether you go somewhere else you want to survive as a as a as an SDR move up become uh, a salesperson become a marketer I believe this is the way to do it so hopefully that that answered uh, answered a little bit of your uh, questions there so I'll just uh, we're coming up we're a little bit past the hour so I'll just see if there's any other questions um, Anyone else have any questions? Well, thank you so much for those of you that stayed uh, uh, stayed the entire time. Uh, uh, everyone that signed up for this webinar will have access to the webinar via a link uh, that will be sent out after this. I do urge you to go ahead and if you'd like to sign up for a mentor session and uh, hopefully that will provide you value. Thanks again uh, for going ahead and coming to our webinars. Our next webinar uh, will be announced very shortly but uh, it's going to be about customer success it's going to be about customer success and how sales um, how that's probably the most important thing that we're ignoring as sales organizations is customer success and what that means to us so thank you again please happy selling have a great August and I'll talk to you soon take care